looking forward to this, although although Barry's buildup did leave me a little bit wary. I, I sort of feel like you know you went to a restaurant, had a great meal, and you tell everybody how good it's going to be. It better be at least that close to that. So ho hopefully, we will, we will give you food for thought. So um, I, I was looking at my own title and thinking about the class, and, and I think um, Stephanie will make a, a point like this later. Um, what we really want to be talking about is not transportation mega projects or perhaps even transportation systems, but mobility, right? Transportation is um, a means to an end, um, literally. Um, it, it is how we get from one place to another um, and what that experience um, is like. Um, and, and just to, to keep on that theme, and I think to think about our, our uh, um, the subject tonight, I, I'm, I'm a little bit curious um, about what kind of transportation all of you use? So let me ask you a couple of questions. How many of you um, got to work or school um, today um, completely by walking or bicycle? You didn't, you didn't partake at all in the transportation system. Oops. Okay. Um, and how many of you walked to a train station and then did your commute by train? very large share of you. Um, how many of you walked to a bus station, a bus stop, and then did your commute, including picking up the, the, the C there, okay? Um, and how many of you drove to a transit station? Um, and how many of you just drove? Um, just, just um, and how many of you live inside of Route 128? Probably should. How many of you live outside of 128? Okay, that would have been easier to count. Um, and of the folks who live in 128, how many of you live in um, a single family detached home? And the rest of you presumably live in a, how many of you live in a, in a, in a multi, you know, bigger than sort of four story building? Okay, so what we, I think the plurality of folks here are living in medium density, um, multi-family buildings um, compared to the region, and by the way, compared to the country uh, by far, um, this is a group that takes a lot more transit um, than, than others. And, and it's, I think, always important in this both to know from your experience, but also to remember to reason um, from elsewhere. How do I actually make the last two? Oh, I probably want to go to the next slide, yeah. Oh, why don't you use <laughs> Thanks. Oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, as Paul pointed out, um, and if I were doing a longer talk, I would, I would go through this, um, the emergence of the automobile, beginning in the 20s, but particularly after World War II, with sort of the rise of American prosperity, um, causes uh, really a, a, a massive exodus uh, out of cities we can debate about to what extent that was orchestrated or not. Um, let's just stipulate that, that it occurred and that in all cities, Boston included, the first response was to say, well, um, our city is outdated and therefore we have to um, build highways. And um, the mass turnpike through the heart of Boston uh, is a great example. Those of you who are old enough to remember the elevated central artery is a great example. Um, and within a relatively short time, um, in historical terms, really a couple of decades, uh, there's a huge revolt against the impacts of that. That's um, where Fred Salvucci um, enters the scene as a, as a uh, young official then uh, in the city of Boston. Um, and a whole bunch of projects are stopped. And as Paul pointed out, um, the Orange Line uh, and the Southwest Corridor Park and some good amount of the vacant land uh, still vacant land on either side of that, was uh, taken for a highway which ultimately wasn't built. In some cases, the, the land wasn't taken. Boston is a locus of these anti-highway disputes. Um, and what emerges is this conception that um, we need, we, the, the way to serve this region is to, is to modernize and expand its transit system. Um, there's a wonderful sort of political history of how federal funding comes in for all of that. But I think what's really interesting in this regard is if we're thinking about Boston, and for the most part, most major American cities, um, we're not 
generally thinking about highway projects, and if we're thinking about highway projects, they're really different. Um, there are things like the Big Dig, which, uh, unlike previous projects, um, takes no residential houses and arguably leaves things better off. Um, you know, we get rid of an elevated highway um, and we get a, a park system. The Globe says it's a not good enough park system, but it is, it is a set of open space. The city, uh, again, those of you who uh, remember the elevated central artery, I think we'll all agree that downtown Boston is prettier uh, and a much nicer place to be and it's a lot easier to get around. Um, we can have a discussion about whether or not $15 billion um, whether we have $15 billion worth of benefit um, or, or not, but that, again, is a different issue. But I think as we look forward in this region, um, massive, massively disruptive urban highways are off the agenda, and for the most part, non-disruptive but very expensive highways in the urban core are off the agenda um, with some minor fixes. So if, if Harvard ever redoes Alston, it might like to deck some of Storo Drive, um, Fred, I know, has been working on that project. But the big projects that are on, on the sort of plate, um, I think you pretty much know them, um, extending the Green Line uh, to Union Square. Uh, uh, this is from Leachmere out to Medford. Um, phase three of the Silver Line, which is essentially a, a tunnel um, underneath Boston to connect uh, the Silver Line as it comes up through the south end with the, with the water for the Silver Line. Um, and Fall River, uh, New Bedford commuter rail, I, I think are the three biggest that are far along in the planning process. There are a couple other projects um, that have been long discussed and are, and at least in my estimation, uh, farther behind the line. And lurking in the background is the fact that um, we don't have enough money, um, even with uh, the transportation reform bill um, that passed, um, to, to keep up our existing facilities. So we, we've got a pretty expensive plate. This is Silver Line Phase 3. Um, it's a really horrible version of the Green Line map. <laughs> um, I'm not a, a techie, uh, if you haven't figured that out yet. I couldn't even find the mouse. Um, and the dotted lines here um, indicate uh, where uh, Fall River New Bedford would add into the existing commuter rail line. So these are big ticket items. Seems reasonable to ask a question saying, well, what, what are we going to get? Um, Public policy, in the end, is about the allocation of scarce resources, time, energy, money. Um, and if you read any of the, the, the documents for any of these projects, you'll, you'll get statements that look a lot like this. Um, this is from the Silver Line uh, Supplemental Environmental Statement of a couple of years ago. Um, so this, uh, by the way, is there, is there anybody who's against substantial transportation, environmental, and economic benefits? <laughs> okay, good. I just wanted to check. Just wanted to and remember, that's our goal. Okay, so what I've been doing over the last couple of years, and, and I think what uh, Barry is hoping will provoke an interesting conversation, is to say, well, okay, um, how much of that do we get at what cost? So um, the first sort of way to think about this is say, all right, let's take these projects, let's say, you know, what's the opportunity cost here? These are long live capital assets, so. Um, just for the hell of it, we're going we're to try and be very generous, say 50 years, 3% discount rate. I mean, this is literally saying the state's going to go take a mortgage to build these projects. Um, you figure there's about 250 um, work days a year, and what you're really concerned about, the bulk of transit ridership is still people going to work. It's not all of it, Steph is going to, uh, I think, touch on this point. Um, and, and then, you know, what's the cost per a new, a new ride, right? Because remember, we're trying to get people to take transit because the roads are crowded and we want to get people off of the roads so that the transportation system works better and, as Paul pointed out, uh, things are a lot more efficient. So this is, with the most recent data that I can find about those, uh, those three projects, plus uh, Greenbush, which was the last of the old colony rail extensions, um, this is the cost in millions. This is from the planning, and the first three cases from the planning documents. Um, and then basically, um, that last line in red is how much, um, because no project covers its operating costs, so we're going to have to fully subsidize the capital cost. This is what we pay according to the estimates from the state transportation officials, some MB, sometimes the MBTA, sometimes um, EOT, or whatever we're now calling it. Um, uh, in the Fall River New Bedford case, it's one of, I, I picked uh, 
kind of the middle option in terms of cost and riders of the four rail options that are online. So this is the stout, the stone route. Uh, it doesn't really change. It runs at about 100. Um, this is per rider per day. Okay? So every time Barry gets on that Fall River train, we're, we're, we're basically throwing 100 bucks to get him to go on the train. So, um, well, if that doesn't get your attention, should we believe the cost estimate? So um, at one point, I took a look at um, how well did we do. We, we expanded our transit system uh, pretty extensively um, in the 90s and, and the, uh, this decade. Um, and how did our estimates uh, of costs compare with what they really were? The, the bluish bars are from the initial cost estimate when we first sort of said, geez, this looks like an interesting project, to, final to, uh, to the final estimate. Um, so when, when they actually kind of, probably the last point before they, they really put a shovel in the ground, the red bars um, are the same thing to what the final reported costs are. This is taking into account inflation. Um, and you can see, at least for some projects, uh, Greenbush uh, in particular, um, the estimates, uh, what we said it was going to cost and what it really cost, um, and, and the final bars are between the final estimate and what it really costs. So, so the time we hit final estimate, we do a pretty good job of knowing what things cost. Um, but the problem is, is that usually the commitment to the project is made based on the early estimate, and there's never a point where we go back and say, is that still worth it? Right? So I want to renovate my kitchen and I budget $5,000 um, and the contractor shows up and we draw the plans and all that and now it's a $50,000 project. I might go, geez, maybe I'll just buy a new refrigerator. Um, <laughs> right? But we don't tend to do that. Um, and just to be an even cheerier tale, this is the same story with ridership. Um, and uh, you'll notice that all the arrows, for the most part, are pointing in the other direction, which is um, we almost always overestimate ridership, um, and even worse, the overestimates tend to get even worse over time. Um, Silver Line Phase uh, 1, um, which is the Washington Street bus line, actually is the one interesting exception to this rule. I've never quite figured out why. Um, and if you look at planned projects, these are, um, this, this is between the initial estimates, most of which are about 1990, when many of these projects uh, were put on the state's um, list of uh, uh, things that had to be done to mitigate the central artery, um, to what the most recent estimates are. Um, now, I want you to notice, look at the, the y-axis here. This, these are not small numbers. Um, this is like 200 to 800% off. This is big. Um, what stuff is costing and what it cost when commitments were made turned out to be really different. Okay, so what's kind of going on? Um, the Silver Line's a really interesting project because it looked like, if you recall my first, this is the Silver Line Phase 3, um, if you looked at that first graph I gave you and said, geez, you know, that, that, that compared to the other projects, the cost per rider looked pretty good. Um, if you start plowing into the planning documents for that, you'll see um, what I'm doing here is comparing population projections between 2000 and 2025 uh, for the region as a whole, so this is what MAPC puts out, uh, for the city of Boston and for the land within a half a mile of the Silver Line, uh, any part of the Silver Line, because um, the idea here is we're going to connect. Um, so we are now presuming in this that the population of that corridor is going to grow uh, roughly 10 times faster than the region as a whole, um, which is kind of an interesting idea that the urban core is going to grow a lot faster than the suburban edge or even the city as a whole. Um, you might want to scratch your head on that one. Um, and if you look at the employment projections, um, you see something similar. And in fact, if you look at the third row where it says change, um, we add almost twice as the, the projections in this document that drive the ridership numbers. You're adding about twice as many jobs in the corridor um, as the city as a whole. So if I do my math right, Barry's the economist, that means that the rest of Boston is going to lose about 20,000 jobs. Um, an interesting assumption um, might be true. Um, be interesting to know where they think those job losses are going to come. So my point here is even where the numbers might look good, we, as 
policy wonks, as it were, want to make sure that the assumptions behind those um, are reasonably plausible. Um, what's really interesting in the case of the Silver Line is um, the ridership projections for the Silver Line were sort of going along at about 30,000 riders total um, for several years. And uh, the Fed start pushing back on the project, saying, geez, we're, we're not really sure it's worth the money. Um, and all of a sudden, the ridership projections jump to the kind of numbers that you're looking at. Um, and um, I, I can't, you know, there's not, that, that's a gun. I don't know if it's smoking. It's certainly two things that are approximate in time. Um, so here's another one um, to look at. This is Fall River, New Bedford. This has been a, a major priority of, of the current administration. Um, there are five options on the table. I'm just going to call them one, two, three, four, five, because I want you um, to look at them for a second. Um, they all roughly take the same amount of time. Actually, option five looks like it's the fastest. Um, option five actually runs every 15 minutes. Everything else runs about every 40 minutes. Option five uh, is about half as expensive, um, although it does have fairly high operations and maintenance costs, probably because it's running pretty frequently. So I would look at this. Uh, which one do you think is going to have the highest estimated ridership? Anybody? Come on. Yeah. I mean, you would, you would think five. Nope. Um, and the reason is uh, options one, two, three, and four are uh, two different routes for railroad, uh, whether they're uh, electrified or diesel trains. Option five is essentially uh, a bus. Now you're wondering how can you spend $800 million on a bus. Um, this is a, a system of dedicated busways, bus lanes. Um, by the way, these numbers are taken from the uh, Central Transportation Planning Staff projections made earlier this year. If you go on the old Colony website, which I did last night, because I don't put these presentations together until the absolute last minute, um, their most recent fact sheet actually tells you that the bus option um, will have 350 new riders. Um, I emailed today and folks said, is this an emergency? We're kind of backed up. And I said, nah, don't worry about it. Um, but it's, it, you know, I mean, it's kind of odd that there's kind of no explanation. And you see this a lot, changing numbers. By the way, um, if I haven't depressed you enough, um, about 1,500 of the people, of, of the riders on any one of these lines are currently taking a privately operated bus. Uh, or, to, to the model, let me actually be more correct. The model believes, because this is looking at year 2025, 20, I believe, the model says if we don't do anything, there'll be about 2,000 riders on the, the privately operated, uh, publicly subsidized bus lines. So that there's an MBTA subsidy that goes somebody's on. Um, and if we build any of these options, about 1,500 of those people will switch. So, so the actual, but we don't call those people transit users because they're not on an MBTA. Uh, or other regional transit authority facility. They're on a private bus, even though the private bus operator might be getting some public money. And that goes back to my point, is what, we're, what we want to worry about is mobility, not... Um, so, um, what, well, what, could, what could we reasonably expect? Um, for, forgive me again for... This is a, a graph that Matt Kahn and, and Nate Bounce Snow did. Um, the top line shows you uh, ridership share, uh, people going to work, um, graph goes, uh, the peak is at about 25%, and that's in 1970, and the bottom line is, how far are you from the central business district? And essentially, it tells us what I think we all know, which is that transit riders tend to be clustered particularly heavily um, in about five, I believe there's actually kilometers, about five to ten kilometers from the central business district in relatively dense neighborhoods. And what Matt's doing here is telling you um, the bottom line is the same data for 2000. And really what you're seeing here is the impact of suburbanization of jobs. Um, so people who live in Somerville, fewer, you know, smaller share of them are, are using transit. Um, but we've got this sort of bump. This is the same graph uh, for New York City. Uh, it, it looks roughly the same. If not, you get uh, obviously a much higher share runs about 40 to 50% up there. So 
Um, we do know that transit can, can carry a lot of people under certain circumstances. Um, it's not as clear. Um, okay. Um, let, me sh let me shoot through uh, real quick a couple of things in here. Um, about 30% of the workers in Boston live within two, mi two kilometers of the rail station, so that mile. Okay, and, and you can see that figure's actually gone up in Boston um, because of the expansion of the transit system. It puts us relatively high. Um, interestingly, only about 7% of the land in Boston is within two kilometers. Um, so if you're thinking about helping people take transit, um, we're going we're to go. Um, let me make, uh, I'm going to cut a couple things short. Um, I, what can commuter rail do? Um, remember, I just showed you really low ridership numbers for, for Fitchburg. So I said to myself, well, is there another place in, in the United States that's got old industrial cities uh, about 40 to 60 miles from the downtown CBD where there's a lot of rail service? So one of the problems with some of these commuter rail lines, it's only one train a day out to Worcester. Uh, Patterson, Trenton. Bridgeport, these are all outside New York, and, and this is great. You know, you got 10, 12% of those people taking transit to work, except it turns out they're all taking buses, not trains. Um, this is the share, the, the, blue, the blue bar is the share of workers in each of those communities uh, on a train. And what's happening is they're going to suburban job nodes. Um, it turns out, if you do the numbers, because the other argument is we have to do this all for air quality, um, the air quality improvements you get from any of these projects um, turn out to be the equivalent of, of basically finding, uh, in the case of Fall River, you know, a couple hundred cars that, that, that didn't pass inspection and tuning them up. You could probably give people uh, Prius. Um, uh, the next rationale you'll hear is environmental justice. For the most part, most of these projects do not meet federal guidelines uh, for environmental justice. So, um, and if you know, you want to pursue that, we can, we can go back to that. So it seems to me, um, as we as policy folks think about these questions, what are we trying to solve? Does the data actually tell us that these are, are um, you know, are we solving those problems? And are the assumptions behind that data plausible? Um, are there intangible benefits or costs? There are reasons to think that transit creates a sense of place, rail transit, um, that bus doesn't. Um, I put it another way, um, this is the best advice I can give you if you want to go into transportation work. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Name what you know to get you in trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Um, and I always counterbalance that uh, with my two favorite transportation analysts, with Einstein's uh, everything that can be counted does not necessarily count. Um, and I think, again, that's part of what we, trains clearly mean something to people in a way that buses don't. And, how we think about that is really important, but how we think about that in the context, particularly of a state that continues to hemorrhage money in its budget, I think is, is uh, particularly